Well, thank you for joining us at the, uh, the Dell breakout session. Um, and I hope most of you were in the, the keynote earlier on, uh, and I kind of covered some points uh, and really talked about private cloud. <clears throat> and the main reason I want to talk about private cloud and talk about simplification of data center is that you heard an awful lot of talk about move to the public cloud uh, and how that can be quite cost prohibitive. Now, all of us here have data centers uh, that we're, we're running today. Um, and those are great, they're full of great hardware. We've got great servers in there, great storage in there. Problem is that we're not able to deliver that data center out to our users in the same way that they can get public cloud. Like, for example, uh, go to Amazon and use that credit card to, to get a machine. So wouldn't it be great if I could take what I've already got, that existing data center, and I could start to run that in the same way as if it were a public cloud, but for my own staff. So the ability to be able to deploy machines out in hours or minutes as opposed to taking months for, for a new project. Um, the ability to, to, to cut the procurement cycle. Um, the ability to, to create a delivery, um, automated delivery vehicle uh, for my users um, allows them to sort of me to step away from that approval process, to automate that process. So reduce the cost of managing my data center, increase the flexibility of my data center, and actually create a cloud environment using hardware I've already got. Not through rip and replace, not through replacing everything I've got, but actually using what I've already got. Why is that important? Well, this is what we're seeing all the time. When I go out and talk to customers, typically this is what I hear from very, very stressed out IT department heads. They're saying, you know what? Everywhere I go right now, I'm getting tons of pressure on what I do. And the pressure primarily is coming from my users. And the thing is, my users are used to having a really good quality of service. They're used to great services they get from the cloud. They're used to great services they get at home. I mean, personally, I've just signed up for a new fiber channel um, based uh, uh, ISP at home. I'm getting, I think, 76 meg at home right now. That's a huge amount of bandwidth that I've got delivered to my house on a quiet little cul-de-sac. And it means that I've got the ability to have cloud services, be able to watch video on demand, um, and have all these great services at home. Now, I, I, I go into the office, I don't have anything like that anymore. I don't have that speed, I don't have the ability to do any of that. So suddenly I'm, I'm getting better services at home than I was getting you know, in the office. And also, I've got loads of different connected devices at home, with different form factors and tablets and, and laptops and you know, uh, you know, smartphones. And I go into the office and suddenly I'm restricted as to what I can do with those because of security policies. So I'm frustrated that I'm not getting the same level of service from my IT department that I could get, for example, at home. Uh, and why is that? Well, it's because in data centers today, we're constantly restricted. But let's look at the business factors. You know, for, OK, this is a, a private business model. But you know, you've got different departments putting different pressures on IT teams because they want to get certain things. For example, you know, I, I need to spin up uh, something quickly for I'm a marketing campaign. I need servers running right now because I'm going to do this big call-out campaign or this web-based campaign. I need that now, not in six months' time. Um, R&D, you know, if we don't develop this new product quickly and deliver it to market, then we're going to lose market share. So it's imperative that I get this now. And all these pressures that are putting put onto IT departments, yet they still have to go through a long procurement cycle, they still have to spend a lot of time setting up these servers, setting up, and, and we all know this pain, setting this all up, you know, deploying hypervisors, deploying operating systems, deploying workloads, delivering it to customers, it takes a long time to do that. And meanwhile, in the middle of it, as we all know, our budgets aren't going up, our budgets are going down. So we're getting all this pressure and all this demand from the business and from the users. And meanwhile, I've got head office sitting there saying, well, actually, you know what? You're going to have to do it for less money. So, so how do I do that? Let's take a step back from that. How do I do that? Well, the main problem is that today, most data centers look a bit like this. And I don't mean your data center personally, but they can look like this with a very, very easily. The point I'm making with this slide is that data centers today are very complex and they're very inflexible, they're very rigid. So, for example, I have to go through a procurement process to buy a new server for a new project. I put that server into my data center, I then have to deploy operating systems to it. Or, for example, if it's a virtual environment, I have to size it up, I have to connect it to some shared storage, and I have to deploy a hypervisor onto it, and then I can deploy virtual machines onto it, which I then have to build up with different operating systems and applications. That's a lengthy process. From, from actually signing it off right the way through to delivering it, it can take months. On average, it can take about six months to deliver that. that, that that's hugely painful for, for a user. Now, what if I've got capacity on demand. So if I manage what I've got inside my data center and deliver it in a more simple way, well, I can't do that because I'll end up with this. 
If I start messing about with that process in a really, in a really fundamental way, for example, spooling up new servers, creating new VLANs, you know, doing this kind of stuff in a kind of haphazard way, I'm going to end up with a massive traffic jam. It's too fragile for me to be able to do that. So I need something in my data center today that means that I can automate this traffic flow, automate my networking, my storage, my servers, my delivery of the applications in a simple way. So how do I create the private cloud in a model that I've got today, in this kind of rigid model? And I think one of the tools that we talked about you know, when I was in the keynote was a product called Dell AIM, for example. Uh, and what Dell AIM does is it, it goes some way to help you with that. So Dell AIM takes a, a, a standard data center as it exists today, your networking, your storage, your servers, and what it does is it creates, a, a, the, the gives you the ability to take those workloads that you have inside your environment, move them over to the SAN, and allow you to deploy those freely and easily around your data center, regardless of what they are, regardless of the type of server, the type of storage. So there are a bunch of tools that are available today that help you move towards a private cloud, regardless of the infrastructure you already have, and the kind of standard infrastructure to avoid this traffic jam scenario. So why are we in the situation that we're in today? Well, let's take a step back a few years. We all remember the mainframe era. The great thing about the mainframe era it was it was so easy to manage. It was really simple. I had one great big huge box inside a data center. I had dumb terminals everywhere. We had virtualization back then. It was really easy. I could just go to my mainframe and I could manage everything. Centralized, simple. If I needed to spin up a workload, I could do that and I could access it from a terminal. Really, really straightforward. A couple of problems in mainframe. It was really expensive and I was completely vendor locked. Yeah, and I didn't like that. And then you know, game changing we saw with the client server era, where, where Dell really came to the fore, was we helped drive down that, that cost of purchase. You think about our servers today, you can go and pick up a Dell server for a, a couple of grand. I mean, that's phenomenal. The kind of technology that you can get you know, on something like a, a, an R2 10 Mark II, for example, a very small server, which is very inexpensive. Even our, our, our very high-end E5 servers that you'll see on, on the booth today, all the Intel E5 stuff, that's very inexpensive in terms of the, the amount of technology you can get compared to where we were a few years ago. So we've really helped drive down that cost of acquiring the hardware. Problem is, yeah, it's definitely the cost has gone down. It's much more flexible. I can do more stuff with it. But you know what? It's a manageability nightmare. You know, how do I manage all of this? I've got all this servers, different servers from different vendors. I've got all this storage, typically different storage from different vendors. I've got my network. I've now got multiple hypervisors. I've got to manage all of those. And how do I, how do I take control of, of all that? When a user comes to me and wants to start a project, I've got to procure servers. I've got to put them, on, put them into the data center. I've got to get them get hypervisors on them. If not, they're going to be physical only. I've got to get operating systems on them. Then got to get the application on there, I've got to get them running, I might have to do some testing. I can then deliver it to, to my user. That, that's, that's a long, long, long process. So how can I possibly move to a model where I can deliver a workload to a user in a matter of hours? Yeah, this is not, not feasible in the model I've got today. And also, I've got these different silos inside my data center. I've got networking teams, I've got server teams, I've got storage teams. They don't always like each other and get on very well. Um, and there can be conflict inside there as well. So I don't want to give one team more control than another. So how do I control that internal conflict inside my, inside my environment as well? Now, the reason this is all important, this is a, I wanted to flash this up. This is a Gartner Top Trends watch that we got through. I'm going to talk about blue points pretty much all the way through. Interesting, virtual enterprise, an expansion of that. Really about different hypervisors coming on board. IT complexity, fabric data centers, hybrid cloud, IT consumption are something called the infinite data center. This is a constant expansion of my data center. The green ones are end user computing points. We can talk about those, but I'm an enterprise person. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about the blue points that are on those slides. So, so our strategy. I love this slide. This photo was taken in our Santa Clara office. It's gorgeous. Uh, um, so we have this new model, which is uh, you probably hear this is a real marketing side, and you hear all these slogans from Dell, you know, all these kind of you know, taglines you put up there. We, we introduced this in, in, at the beginning of this year, and we said, this is, this is what we're all about now. And we have these colors attached to it. And this is why I'm showing this slide, because you'll see these different colors throughout the deck. We want to help you achieve more, deliver real results, and deliver them much faster, and maximize the efficiency of a data center. That's what we're trying to do from a Dell enterprise perspective. So it's very much focused on, on you and what we can help you do inside your data center. We're not, it's not focused on the technology, 
It's not something that's you know, kind of abstract. It's about what can we do to help you. And some of the tools that you'll see, if you go to the booth and talk to the guys there as well, and some stuff I'll talk about here, you don't even have to have Dell hardware inside your data center to benefit from this. So it's quite a step away from where we were even a few years ago. Yeah, of course we'd love you to buy Dell hardware. We've got some great hardware. But we know there's a reality that not everyone has Dell hardware or you have a mixture of different hardware. There. So the first point to talk about is VIS. And I mentioned these earlier on um, in my keynote briefly. So I'm going to go into some more detail on them. The VIS portfolio stands for Virtual Integrated System from Dell. Loads of acronyms, apologize. The Virtual Integrated System is a portfolio of software products. Inside that portfolio today are two software products. One is called Dell Advanced Infrastructure Manager, and the one is called Dell VIS Creator. Now, Advanced Infrastructure Manager is a unique product. It's something that we acquired from a company called Scalent in Palo Alto a few years ago, and we acquired that company. Um, we weren't the only people interested in that technology because it's very exciting technology. Now, you probably heard me go through this in some detail. Well, I say some detail to go through this in, in the keynote as to what it can do and how it can help you. What AIM does is it takes workloads that exist on your servers today. In fact, it takes the whole server. It takes the operating system. It takes all the applications. It takes everything that makes that server a server inside my data center. So it takes um, the worldwide names from the HBA. It takes the MAC addresses from the, from the NICs. It takes you know, the, 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 the VLANs that it's connected to. It takes all that information. Yeah? And it understands where it is from a networking perspective, a server perspective, a storage perspective inside my data center. And it rolls that up into something we call a persona, just a term, um, and then puts it onto SAN. Now, you think about AIM a bit like boot from SAN, but on like a lot of steroids. Yeah? So essentially, you know, I've put it onto my SAN, and now I can deploy that. And it, it, we're not virtualized, bear in mind. What I've done is taken a workload, put it onto SAN, and I can now spin that up anywhere else inside my data center. And the way that I do that is because I've now decoupled the workloads from the hardware that exists inside there, and, and at a heterogeneous level. So I've, say I took it from an IBM server, for example, and I created this persona from an IBM server. It's running Windows. It's got a couple of applications on there. It's now sat on my SAN. And I want to deploy that on a nice, shiny new Dell 12G server. Right? I can just simply deploy it. I haven't got to do any conversion work. I just deploy it. What happens is we do a pre-boot, pixie boot. We take all that information that we had on that server, the IBM server, those HBA uh, worldwide names, those MAC addresses. Yeah, we talk to the switch and we understand, OK, well, it's now connected to these ports. We assign the VLANs on that switch. We tie it together and we allow that persona to boot on that server because yeah, we've, we've allowed that server to be created to a point that will allow that persona to boot up. And we can do that not just with physical machines, we can also do that with virtual machines as well. So I can take a VM from Hyper-V or from Zen, and I can move it across to VMware or vice versa. Now that's really cool because I could have a very, very expensive, shiny VMware environment inside my data center and a low-cost Zen environment inside my data center. But the problem I'm finding is that here, I, here I've got test dev, low cost, and actually, you know what? I can't develop here because I still have to test it in VMware before I can deploy it to my live VMware site. So I've got this additional step in the way, which is expensive and takes time. Well, with the name environment, I can test dev on Zen or Hyper-V, and I can just move that virtual machine across to VMware seamlessly, without conversion. I'm not talking about conversion or migration here. We're talking a span of a reboot. Boom, I can bring that machine up. Okay, now, most people go, it's hocus pocus, it's magic, so you've got smoke and mirrors involved. Um, we've got some guys on the stand who've actually done AIM deployments uh, around Europe uh, uh, very successfully with a bunch of customers, uh, and you can go and talk to them about their experiences with this. Uh, most of the time we find when we talk to customers like yourselves, they say, that's not going to work, it's not going to work. Well, we can deliver a proof of concept. You can see it working in our own labs. Uh, you can see it working at Microsoft Labs, for example. Uh, uh, and their MTCs, uh, or we can take it to your data center, and we can actually show it working in your data center. And we can even do that on your equipment. So you know, we're, we're very keen to prove that it really does work, it really does do what it says on the tin. Very, very powerful tool. So suddenly, I've got this flexibility. And I mentioned in the keynote, here's a cool thing that I can do with this. Let's think about some of the, the, the things I can do. So I, suddenly, I can move between old hardware and new hardware without any pain, seamlessly. Well, that's great, because I've got some really old servers here that I want to get rid of, and they're actually running old operating systems, well, I can move them to virtual environment. 
seamlessly without having to do my, wow, that's, that's, that's made my life so much easier. Or I've got some old servers, I want to migrate to new servers. Well, now I can do that in a really simple fashion. Or I've got a VMware hypervisor machine running somewhere, I've got a VMware host machine running, and I've got a Hyper-V host machine running. Let's say I have a problem with one of these machines. One, one of the demos that we do with Microsoft a lot, they're very keen on this one for some weird unknown reason, is that we have a we simulate a VMware host failing. And all we do is we migrate all the virtual machines across to their Hyper-V host. Shockingly, they love that. Um, but what's, what's inter interesting about that is that we're able to do that seamlessly yeah, in an environment. And we can do all of that from within inside System Center. So, I mean, that, that's fantastic. Because in System Center, obviously, I can see virtual machines on different hypervisors, which I can't do within vCenter. So it's very interesting that I can see that migration work in a seamless way. The nice thing about that is you can automate all of that. So if I get an alert, because I've got integrated management, so I've got an alert, okay, what I want to do now using that pro pack is tell the system, okay, take the virtual machines with AIM, move them across to another available hypervisor, I don't care which one it is, yeah, power that thing down, redeploy a bare metal hypervisor on another machine, spin it up, so I've now got that hypervisor again inside my data center, and then give me, send me an alert to say that my server needs a new RAM, uh, a new, new stick of RAM, or uh, it's got a problem with a hard disk, whatever. Now that's suddenly a cloud-like environment inside my data center, using a tool over something that you've already got. But in, in every step of the way with AIM, we haven't said, introduce Dell hardware. You know, do this with the hardware you've already got, the networking you've already got, the SAN you've already got, the servers you've already got. So it's a really good enablement tool. The other piece is Creator. Um, and Creator is, I mean, is, 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 the, is the private cloud piece. It's, it's the way that we deliver that to the end user. Because AIM, although it's really powerful, gives you DR, gives you all these great features, it's still a, a data center tool. It's still for the IT department. Yes, it makes it much easier to manage my, my data center, but it's still a back-end tool. Creator is the front end. It's what delivers that, that environment to the user in a simplified fashion. So it's a catalog-based tool. Essentially what happens, the user goes along to this tool, it's on the intranet, and they can say, it knows who they are using LDAP lookup, and it says, oh, okay, I know who you are, I know which department you're in. And because of that, here is your catalog, which you've customized. And this is what's available to you, and these are the costs associated with those machines. So you could have a VM running Linux for this cost, all the way up to a four-socket Intel running Windows with loads of RAM, with a much bigger cost associated with it. And you can select that. So they'll go along and say, well, actually, of course I want the biggest one, but you know, it's going to get charged back to my cost center, so I'm going to pick this one. This is, what, this is good enough for what I need. What will happen then is it sets off a workflow. And the workflow will have deployment in there. And it, what's cool is we can tie that into AIM as well. But typically, you tie that into your hypervisor. So you'd say, OK, spin up a, a Hyper-V virtual machine or spin up a VMware virtual machine, whatever, and, and deliver that service to the user. So it will go ahead goes through a decision-making process, which, which includes, you know, for example, is that user allowed to have that? Yes, no, it can, go, it can set, flag up an alert to some of the IT team to actually come along and, and, and have that approval queue in place. So it gives you that governance and approval line. Um, say, OK, fine, that user can have that. Then goes away, automatically spins up that machine based on templates, which we which created. And then it delivers that to the user. And it'll send an automated email to the user saying, here is your new virtual machine, here's the IP address, you can go ahead and you can use that. Or here is your new workload. It doesn't have to, see, it doesn't have to be a virtual machine, it can be physical. Here's your workload, you can go ahead and use that. Now suddenly, I've created a private cloud by integrating two tools onto a data center that I already have, that I'm already working. And you remember that slide I put up with the roundabout and all the cars? Yeah, all those barriers are gone. Yeah, this, you know, I, I've now created automated policemen who are directing traffic throughout the whole environment. I haven't got to do that. My IT team don't have to do that. So I've cut the cost of managing my data center significantly, and I've delivered a much, much better service to my users. I've stopped them having to say all the time, guess what, I'm going to go to Amazon, I'm going to go somewhere else. I don't need you, IT team. Your service isn't good enough. So I've fixed two problems by integrating two tools. I mentioned before in the keynote as well, the really nice thing about Viz Creator is it kills server sprawl and virtual server sprawl, because it only gives you those virtual machines on a lease basis. And if it recognizes that a machine hasn't been used, it'll claw back that resource. And if you manage that with AIM, one well, of the nice things about AIM as well, if you think about utilization inside my data center, how utilized are my servers? On average, something between 7 and 20% on average that we're seeing in data centers. 
Seven percent. Wow. Right. So, but why have you gone? Why have you done that? Because I've got peak loads at certain times, so I have to do it. That peak load might just be you know, three times a year. It might be at enrollment, for example. I have a peak load. Oh, okay, fine. So for the rest of the year, I've got machines with big, big power supplies sucking up all this power, spewing out all this heat, which I then have to pay to cool down inside my data center. That's all cost, and it's doing nothing. I've just got a radiator, essentially, inside my data center. So, so how do I fix that? Well, AIM, what you can do is you can do spool up and spool down. You can say, at peak times, spool that workload up onto a big, all singing, all dancing, four socket machine with tons of RAM and do what you need to do. For the rest of the year, spin it into a VM. It's still available, it's just I don't need all the power in there. So suddenly I've got a way of managing utilization inside my data, data center and again, have been able to reduce costs. So that's really what it is. Does that sound exciting? It's got to sound exciting, surely, surely. It'll help you save all this money. How can that not be exciting? So, yeah, so AIM, I've already talked about this in quite a lot of detail. So these are the challenges up front here. So my data center is already inflexible. I've got a lot of waste. I've got lock-in. That's an important thing as well. Virtualization solutions create lock-in. Um, I go to a lot of shows, as you can imagine, and some of those shows are hosted by virtualization providers, shall we say. And probably the one question I get asked the most today is, help me get away from virtualization lock-in. There was a time when the one question I used to get asked all the time was, help me get away from server vendor lock-in. I think we fixed that now, and now they're saying, Ugh, virtualization lock-in. I just had an interesting conversation with VMware about my vSphere 5 licensing, help. You know, so we get that a lot, and it's like, well, okay, AIM is a really good way of helping you manage that. Because all of a sudden, you've got the ability to move workloads seamlessly between different hypervisors and manage it all from a central place. I don't have that today. Now, you could say I could put System Center 2012 inside my environment. It's expensive, SCVMM and System 2012. But the nice thing about it is I can manage different hypervisors as silos. I can manage VMware here, I can manage Hyper-V here, I can manage Zen here. What I can't do is move the virtual machines between them. I can migrate between them, but I can't just bounce them between them. AIM enables you the ability to move them between them seamlessly. Yeah. And convergence. So virtualization, private cloud. And I've talked about that in great detail as well. So I've already gone through the details on what AIM is. And these are the different use cases that are available. I've talked about these in some detail already. The ability to move the workloads dynamically, physical to physical, physical to virtual, virtual to virtual, enable disaster recovery, uh, recovery, recovery uh, dynamically dial up and dial down physical and virtual machines, uh, automate workloads, move workloads around between different failovers, automatic failover in a non-virtual environment, I think it's a really great feature. You know, so we understand if a server has gone down for whatever reason, uh, you know, it's a non-Dell server, that's a good reason. Uh, so <laughs> let's say a server's failed for whatever reason it might be, uh, or even I've got a pre-failure alert. So I'm getting an amber alert from a server to say the server is degraded. You know, I can set up, a, I can spin up a workflow. They'll say, okay, fine, take that, high, uh, that, that workload, that persona, and move it somewhere else. And if it's a virtual host, take all the VMs, move them somewhere else, power it down, spin up a new, bare metal hypervisor somewhere else inside my environment and move all the workloads back to that if I want to. And I can do all of that completely automated fashion. And I can unify all that in a for a heterogeneous environment in a single console. And if you want to, I can even integrate that into tools that you've already got, like VMware, vCenter, or like System Center. So we're all about integration, or BMC, Atrium as well. So we're all about you know, integration. You're gonna see more and more of those integration points coming through from Dell. But when we say data center simplification, we actually mean it. A lot of our competitors say, we can help you simplify the management of a data center. Look, here's a whole node of new consoles. That's not simplifying anything. That's giving me more complexity. What we're trying to do is give you those simplification points inside consoles that you already know how to use, that your IT teams are already comfortable with using. I've talked about that in great detail, so I'm not going to go through it. And here's some of those workloads graphically for you. So private cloud, spin up and spin down. Uh, if I have a failure, a non-Dell server, I can spin it up somewhere else. And site-to-site -site disaster recovery. I haven't really talked about that in great detail, but you can imagine if I've got the ability to have failover, manage failover inside a single data center, I can do that between two data centers. So in this environment here, I've got two data centers. They're both managed by AIM. I've got different, on the back of it, I've got different storage up there. These could be three different SANs. 
Now I need to replicate the storage between the two sites. AIM doesn't do that, <coughs> but let's say, for example, this is an Equilogic SAN or a Compellent SAN. With Equilogic, obviously I get replication for free in the box. So I could have two Equilogic SANs and I could be replicating it back and forth. Just an example because it's a Dell product, it doesn't have to be a Dell product. If I'm replicating the storage routine there, what am I also replicating? I'm replicating my personas, right? So if I've got a failure on this data center, let's say I have a flood here, which is pertinent given the weather, I have a flood on one data center, what I can do is I can spin up all those personas, those workloads, on my other data center. And they will look just like they did on that data center there. And these could be completely dissimilar. Now, this could be all Dell hardware, this could be all IBM hardware. This could be all physical, this could be all virtual. This could be one hypervisor, this could be another hypervisor. Most DR solutions today rely on having two sites that are identical. What we're saying is that you can have a dissimilar environment. I could, for example, in this environment here, have two data centers doing quite different things. Yeah? And they're not really DR at all. But I've, I've made sure there's a few servers powered down that I can use as virtual hosts. And I, or I can have just hypervisors on them, just doing nothing. I can spin them up if I, if I have a failure over here and bring them all this up as virtual machines inside this environment. Yes, it's not going to run anywhere near as quickly as it's running over here, but at least those services are available at a time of disaster. So really powerful. There's the graphics. So don't just take my word for it, because I'm from Dell and I'm, gonna, I'm an evangelist, I'm going to talk about this and say, aren't we fantastic? Talk to our customers. And a good example is Clemson University in the States um, have <coughs> put AIM in place. They loved it. They really loved it. And you can see the comment there saying is that it handles work mobility, it's unique, and allows applications to move quickly and to spin up new servers. That, that, that's a really powerful tool. Uh, and this is, this is you know, someone in, in, in education space has put this in place, making it work. Blackboard.com, who's heard of blackboard.com? Nobody used blackboard.com? Software as a service, mainly in the education market? Surprise. What was in the virtual learning Yes, yeah. yeah. So blackboard.com, their data center uh, they have in Washington and the one they have in Amsterdam, 100% running on AIM. Yeah. Every single workload runs on AIM. And they actually manage it at a CLI level. Yeah, we have an interface that you can plug in there, but those guys, they love it, they manage it at a CLI, at CLI level. So being to date, it's very impressive. And that's something that you know, we're all familiar with, Blackboard. And you know, not just you know, customers like Clemson who have put this in place in, a, in their environment. Creator, again, I've gone through this in some detail, and I'm aware that we're running short on time, so I'm going to whiz through this, because I want to talk about hardware as well. And I talked about this as well, integration into existing management tools like VMware. Uh, this is the plugin. If you probably saw this at the keynote, uh, it's a download. Um, it's very, very inexpensive in terms of licensing. Uh, and essentially, what it allows you to do is manage all your hardware inside vCenter. It allows you to do uh, rapid deployment and provisioning, <coughs> seamlessly inside vCenter, firmware updates. Um, you can manage your warranty. You can do warranty renewal from inside here now as well, without having to go outside of vCenter. So really powerful. We've seen competitive products that have tried to do this, and they just give you links back to websites. This is a real working plugin that allows you to manage your hardware. We have this for our servers. We also have a similar plugin for our storage now as well. Uh, and plugins integration to the system center. I talked about this at the keynote as well. So integration into SCCM, uh, SC, uh, SCOM or SCOM, and SCVMM. Integration points at every single level. Integration points through the lifecycle controller, which you'll see on the hardware, which Hugh will talk about just now. Integration points from our management packs and also our pro packs for our virtualization management as well. The so total integration. Right, I'm going to pass over to Hugh. Sorry. It's okay. We started late, so we've run over. My name's Hugh Jenkins. I work with, uh, with Luke on the server solution side. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we have. Thank you, Luke. Some of the work that we have going on um, on the infrastructure side to to make things, you know, hopefully uh, a lot less complex and uh, and simpler for customers as they're deploying both uh, virtualization and moving uh, into uh, cloud type architectures. And a lot of the things I'll talk about, um, you know, definitely build upon and leverage some of the management layers that uh, Luke has, has just talked about here. The, the first thing I wanted to um, focus on was the uh, VSTAR 
solutions. So um, what, what I'm going to talk about here is something, a, a trend that we definitely see where you know, cu customers are you know, more and more thinking about the various critical infrastructure components, so server storage, network fabrics and management tools as a, as a converged entity and clearly with virtualization and moving to cloud we've seen as Luke's talked about the workloads increasingly abstracted from that underlying hardware but a requirement to be able to uh, deploy that consistently and, and also manage it in a increasingly singular way for customers. And it's uh, no coincidence that there's a, a, a picture of a factory here because the, the conversations that we're having with customers, uh, you know, are, are, they very much see the kind of IT infrastructure often as the, the, the factory within their organizations and almost having it run like a tr traditional factory. So thinking about, you know, inputs and outputs and certainly, you know, throughput of that factory certainly things like you know the consistency and availability and continuity of that production environment and um, you know and also the thought of being able to you know dial up and dial down capacity to run you know an efficient factory and, and we certainly believe that the the vstart concept you know really plays into this and and, and resonates strongly with with customers so you know, VSTAR, as perhaps you heard in the, in the keynote earlier from Luke, it, it is basically a, a converged solution targeted very much at initially um, virtualization requirements and from there b building it out into a, a, a cloud-ready solution. And that's where you're going to see us over time add more of the um, management layers as standard. And we'll, and we'll get into kind of the the components here in a second. But the, the reason we got to um, a solution like, uh, like VSTART was, you know, ho hopefully kind of explained a little bit by the diagram here. So, you know, we, we found through, you know, all of our touch points with, with customers worldwide and uh, also the incredible, you know, success uh, uh, that we've had in, um, in deploying virtualized solutions with customers, that these things um, are not necessarily and do not to need to be customized projects. In fact, uh, you know, what we find is that most of the things that, that customers want to do fit you know, right, right in the middle of that bell curve there. And, you know, and, and we found that uh, you know, certainly the experience is, is, is that customers will do, you know, a big virtualization project like this maybe once every, you know, three or four years or so, um, and, and we're doing it, um, you know, three to five hundred times perhaps a day worldwide. And th those learnings allowed us to put together um, a, a converged solution around VSTAR, which we find uh, fits very much uh, most of the things that customers are trying to do with uh, virtualized systems. Sure, you know, there may be some, you know, outlying conversations about uh, particular, maybe custom applications that are not suited to that, but most of the things customers are doing involve, you know, fairly custom applications that are being virtualized in a fairly standardized way. Hence, you know, we felt something like VSTAR, you know, would be able to be productized and, and deliver significant value to customers. So, so what, what we've done is really brought to market this, um, you know, virtualized and, and cloud system in Iraq. And um, the, the value around it is to really help to remove um, a lot of the time and complexity and cost involved in, you know, m maybe doing a virtualization project from scratch. So, you know, sizing systems, testing systems, you know, qualification, you know, build, deployment, all of that takes, you know, a significant amount of time that, you know, many customers just don't have anymore. 
So being able to provide, if you like, a blueprint and a ready-to-run system, as you can see there, that can be delivered directly from the factory and dropped into the data center just like that in a, in a pod ready to run with Hyper-V or, or VMware management tools, storage, 10 gig fabrics, is something that we, f we find, well, customers are finding very compelling because it allows them to get to time to productivity much, much more quickly with these kinds of solutions. Now, we have, um, we're, we're, we're lucky to have actually um, w one of the systems with us today. So if you go to our um, booth out there, we actually have um, a, a, a V-Start 50. But this is what the, the, the portfolio looks like right now. So we have a, uh, and the 5100-200 is a kind of notional sizing for you know, n number of virtual machines that, that customers may choose to run on that. And clearly that's going to be you know, application dependent, but it, it, it kind of gives a bit of a guideline. So, so these systems, as I've said, are put together, you know, valid validated, tested, and configured with um, a, a choice of either uh, VMware or uh, Microsoft Hyper-V-based virtualization solutions. And what you can see is a combination of uh, server, so in this case, the, the 50, we have um, a couple of, uh, of 12th generation R620 servers, we have some uh, uh, 10 gig Ethernet uh, switching, so you know redundant uh, switch fabrics in there. Also some iSCSI SAN storage, so clearly you know for virtualized solutions to take advantage of you know things like you know vMotion with VMware. Um, increasingly, uh, storage area network is uh, you know pretty much well, not mandatory, but you know a very good idea. Um, so we offer a, a iSCSI based storage solution. So you can start off with, you know, a couple of terabytes or so, and actually uh, scale that out in a, in a, a very modular way as you as you need to. And then also, uh, kind of uh, power uh, infrastructure as well. And then as you you kind of go up the series, uh, we would uh, add, you know, more switch capability, uh, certainly more servers. So for instance. Um, you know, here you'd have kind of uh, three servers for your virtual machines and a server dedicated for some of those management tools that Luke talked about. So, you know, VMware, you're running uh, perhaps vCenter or definitely vCenter on a 620 and similarly um, uh, System Center uh, if you have the Microsoft variant. And then through up to the kind of uh, big beast here. So here you have, you know, more power, um, the capability of scaled out storage and uh, obviously that can be redundant as well with more production servers. So these are the, the kind of three products we have in the portfolio right now. The intent actually is to, later this year, is to s scale further this way. So if you think about, uh, you know, what would be the next thing there. Um, I, I, I'm not allowed to tell you what it is, but you can, you know, pretty much guess that uh, you know, it might be have, might be a good idea to have uh, you know a blade option in there, for instance. Uh, uh, cer certainly, might be a good idea to uh, offer potentially a choice of either iSCSI or you know fiber-based storage. So you so you will see us um, um, scale this uh, uh, upward uh, fairly shortly now. And um, as you can see here, and I'll talk about this in a bit more them in a bit more detail in a minute. We've also just added uh, the latest uh, 12th generation uh, servers in there with the latest uh, Intel E5 processors. So, you know, all the time, as I think we all know, infrastructure's changing, but we're moving pretty quickly to, uh, to make sure that these components and platforms uh, stay kind of time to market with those technologies, because clearly if a customer's going to look for, you know, this kind of converged solution, they do want to be you know, certainly up there towards the leading edge of um, technology availability. And then as I've uh, uh, kind of mentioned, um, uh, and hopefully has been, you know, fairly, fairly clear by, 
um, I including in these systems the you know all of those converged infrastructure components you know as one thing, but also the fact that they have been you know tested together, you know tested with either you know VMware or Hyper-V, you know whatever your hypervisor of choice will be, um, validated and from there. Uh, even um, you know, kind of productized in the factory. So, so these things are you know built, they are uh, cabled, labeled, you know, delivered as a rack solution, and uh, also in, installed by engineers on site and brought up uh, to a state where the uh, hypervisor is enabled. It really does allow customers to get you know a, a very sort of um, fast start on, on these kind of uh, virtualization um, projects. And, uh, you, know, you know, we've certainly seen that, uh, you know, that initial setup and deployment is, is highly, highly valued um, by, by customers. And so these are the, these are the kinds of things that, that customers are doing with this kind of uh, converged virtualized infrastructure. Um, it's been applied to everything from, you know, maybe kind of s small, smaller data centers, uh, e even out to uh, remote or, or branch offices. So what one customer we have in the U.S. is uh, c currently automating uh, all of their large retail branches with a VSTAR 50 in each of those branches to run the local in-store systems connected back to a, a, a central data center facility. So, I mean, it, 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 it looks like kind of big iron, and it is big iron, but customers are deploying these also into these kind of remote and, uh, and, and, and branch office opportunities as well. Um, you know, certainly as, as customers start to virtualize and then, you know, layering in the management tools that Luke talked about, moving towards more kind of private cloud environments. Customers kind of value the infrastructure for that. And also in some cases, um, it's being used where uh, people want to maybe ring fence a new application project away from existing infrastructure. Uh, it just allows a very fast track to go place an application on a kind of ready to go virtualization pod very, very quickly. So, so that is another kind of important use case that we see for, for these kinds of configurations. But, you know, as it says here, you know, really finding a home in you know, everything from smaller to the largest of the large data centers. And the, the kind of largest stuff that I hinted at earlier, um, you know, that, that, that is being looked at in particular as customers Look at things like large-scale VDI projects and needing, um, you know, a lot of capacity at, at the back end to support, you know, many thousands of kind of VDI instances. You know, that 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 is a very very strong driver for, for the kind of top end of the VSTAR port portfolio. And here's just one example, um, and I, I, hopefully you kind of got the flavour of, of of what customers get get from this, but this customer here, um, Broadart, um, they, they felt that they were able to achieve, you know, a, a 6x faster time to value in going the VSTART route than having to go through, you know, all of that, you know, t like skill up, test, configure, um, you know, roll out and all, uh, uh, around doing that themselves in a custom way. So, um, you know, 6x faster time to value, you know, they, they were able to, you know, deploy the actual servers, they, they reckon 10 times faster, as well as the kind of, you know, virtualization benefits as well that, that you know, we all are well schooled in now, being able to reduce things like data center rack space and free up floor space and, you know, dropping uh, power and cooling costs by, by 30 to 40 percent. So not only do you get those, you know, virtualization benefits, but also this kind of faster time to productivity is very important for customers. So, 
So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the converged infrastructure and then um, earlier Luke had mentioned um, a lot of work that's going on around uh, some, of the, uh, some of the new server infrastructure solutions. So um, in the last sort of uh, five or ten minutes here, I just wanted to quickly track through uh, what's happening there because it's very topical in the last few weeks we've uh, announced uh, a, a, 12, a refresh in our portfolio, so our 12th generation of x86 server platforms. And in fact, uh, we just did a second wave of announcements um, just yesterday. So um, the good thing is we have some of those platforms uh, out, out on the booth here. So j just to kind of sort of whiz through some of the kind of highlights of, um, of, of these platforms and how it uh, really ties into, in particular, virtualized and cloud solutions. The first thing on these new x86 platforms um, really complements of some of the work that Intel have done around the new uh, E5 uh, 2600 um, processor platforms and chipsets. We're able now to drive, you know, even a two-socket server platform up to what is a, you know, fairly incredible uh, memory density. So, uh, so one of these systems supporting, you know, up to over 750 gig of memory, and and certainly virtualized requirements are have have been driving that over the last couple of years. So. You, you, so you kind of see that now as standard, so you're not having to um, you know, compromise in any way around some of the memory capacity. The, the other side um, uh, is I.O. So I think as we all know, you know memory is one thing with virtualization and having uh, enough uh, I.O. bandwidth to keep up with it is pretty important. And then also to be able to throttle that's quite nice as well. So we have um, this capability on uh, many, of the, many of the new platforms delivered through, uh, through a Dell in innovation, the um, uh, select network cards, where you can, with a, with a, a 10 gig ethernet card, you can actually uh, now divide up that bandwidth and you know, assign it uh, to you know particular uh, ports. So, for instance, you know a, a port one could have you know up to four NICs with dividing that 10 gig bandwidth into you know two gig, three gig, etc. So that you can, in a very granular way, allocate bandwidth to particular applications using those uh, those 10 gig Ethernet ports. But doing it in a way that is um, kind of agnostic with respect to what switching infrastructure you've got. So in the, in the past and still currently, there are other vendors that, that are able to do this, but not in a switch agnostic way. So you know, we feel that that's just more valuable to customers to be able to do that you know, e easily in a less complex way and not be compromised around what particular brand of, of, of switching fab fabric you use. So, that switch independent partitioning. And again, uh, you know, on the theme of virtualization and how you, uh, you know, make sure that critical applications are, are well supported. We have a feature that isn't new from Dell, but it's something that we have now been able to roll out across many, if not all, of our 12th generation platforms, which is being able to support, you know, not, not just uh, in, an embedded hypervisor. And what I mean by that is being able to run a hypervisor and boot it from an SD card, internal SD card in the servers, but have that also protected by a recovery card. So if you go and have a look in the, the booth out there, we will show you these two SD cards that are able to, you know, we're able to set up in this kind of redundant mirrored state to protect against the unlikely event of you know some kind of SD card failure taking out your hypervisor on your platform and all the applications which you know no, no one no one wants to think about that right but you know pretty important I think as we all know so that's a nice feature and another one is, is there anyone here who is doing any work around put, putting applications out onto uh, GPU 
devices. So this is a trend that we see now starting particularly you know, in, in some of the financial markets, in some of the oil and gas industries where um, customers are looking at you know, re requiring you know, intense computational capability and to be able to write code that runs on these um, you know, low cost but extremely high performance GPUs. Um, and uh, as, I th as I think you can see here somewhere, you know, like some of the cards have got you know, over a thousand cores on a, on a kind of PCI-based card. So you, you know, really can you know, crank sort of supercomputer-like performance from these things for, f for apps that are written to support them. So, so that coding is going on out there in the world. And you know, what we're finding is more and more customers are asking about running GPU-like devices within the servers, and, and many of our servers support that today. Interesting development. Not even, you know, not even, Intel's latest CPU, and people are still talking about, oh, give me a GPU to offload. Another area um, that we can, uh, we can show you is uh, a development around n not just the use of, um, of SSD technology, but being able to uh, d drive that in internally from a PCI based card supporting uh, up to uh, four SSDs, but uh, d delivered using um, a what will hopefully be a putative new standard for um, SSDs within uh, a standard hot plug drive cage. So that's a, that's a that's a mechanical standard that we're working through at the moment and supporting. But uh, but th this is uh, you know I think cu customers you know are starting to get interested in the kind of fusion I/O type technology, and this is. Um, you know, v very much the uh, equivalent of that uh, delivered delivered by Dell for you know high-speed search things like you know big data analysis those kinds of things, and uh, you know many of the platforms now support these kind of specialized disk configurations for you know extremely uh, high-speed um, uh, IOPS. So as you can see here, you know up to sort of 500x. Uh, I increases in, in I.O. performance for kind of disk-orientated applications. So that's a nice uh, new innovation. And then, and then continuing uh, in the theme of storage, uh, some of the work we've done around the new uh, uh, RAID controllers uh, with f uh, a firmware feature called Cascade. And for, uh, for read operations, uh, this kind of intelligently starts to pick out you know, um, uh, data hotspots and caches them locally. And uh, again, uh, provides uh, extremely high speed performance from cache for uh, a lot of read operations that customers may have for you know, databases, et cetera, that are being supported on uh, in primarily internal uh, RAID-based storage on, on drives. And then, uh, you know, th through to the kind of uh, power efficiency side. So, so this is what one thing as, uh, as customers are building out, you know, data centers with virtualized or even cloud environments, then clearly, you know, one of the concerns is, is around power and cooling. And, you know, what if, in particular, that cooling should fail? And you know, I think we can all quote a horror story of um, you know of, of either that happening to us or, or or you know it happened to a good friend somewhere where um, you know air conditioning in the data center failed, the temperature goes up, and pr and pretty quickly if um, you know if if you're not equipped to counteract that failure, that then servers are going to be in a in a critical zone in terms of temperature. So one of the things that we have been able to do is something called, that we're calling uh, Fresh Air Solutions, which is basically qualifying the server platforms for e excursions outside of the normal operating uh, temperatures that, that we test at. And so you know, more, more specifically, uh, many of the 12G platforms are now qualified to actually run 
at up to 45 degrees centigrade for, you know, for short periods of time to, to allow customers to you know, counteract um, you know, something like a chiller failure if, if necessary and, and give them some time to, to recover those servers. So uh, you know, that, that, that is something that is um, still, I'm pretty sure it's still a, a, a unique capability in terms of um, you know, that, that running at that kind of temperature. So that's something that uh, w we offer as a you know, standard feature that y you can expect that these servers will be qualified to do that. Particularly handy for customers that are looking at saving cost by ratcheting up the, you know, taking the ambient temperature up a little bit on, uh, on data centers, saving a lot of cost there, or, or indeed in the event of, uh, of a complete failure. And then um, uh, one of the other things, we're not showing this today, but we can, uh, we can you know, we've got some sort of videos but that, that we can um, walk through with you. But all, all of the um, systems now featuring uh, power management software, so the Open Manage Power Center, which allows uh, customers to set you know, power policies, power capping, um, uh, uh, also kind of fast power caps, uh, millisecond fast capping if a, if a circuit goes. And to be able to do that, not just for a you know, single server, server platform, but you know, kind of aggregate that across you know, a, a rack, a row, a column, or indeed uh, entire multiple data centers. So uh, we think you know, a useful new tool to start to be able to c control some of, those, um, some of those things around um, power dynamics in the data center at the server hardware level. And also a move to offer, you know, certainly the server monitoring tools is now uh, uh, ag an agent-free release. So this is going to remove a heck of a lot of complexity that customers have around, you know, managing agents and, you know, up, you know keeping up uh, you know, agents updated, uh, rolling out new agents. You know, have, have you got an agent for a particular operating system? No, we haven't, so which means you, you can't have all of the sort of management tool richness that we could offer. So being able to move to an agent-free model just allows customers many more degrees of freedom around what environments they can now manage in a powerful way, as well as removing, we think, a lot of complexity around updating in, you know, the management infrastructure outside of just using it. And then, um, you know, also a kind of not nice, uh, not nice feature, which is, uh, as with many of these things, a kind of best, best kept secret, it's something called Repository Manager, or we call it Repo Man internally, if you've seen that film, which is going back a bit. Uh, what, what this does is if you have a, you know, if you have a, a server infrastructure, being able to, you know, update that potentially in a sort of one-to-many way, uh, around sort of latest firmware updates, but, but do that in a kind of managed way. That's what Repository Manager does. So, be, so it, it, it enables you to set up a server as the Repository Manager, um, have, you know, have a single connection out through the firewall via that server. Uh, that, that, that then uh, pulls down the latest firmware updates from the Dell update catalog to allow you inside the firewall as and when you want to, to push out those updates to uh, many servers, potentially you know, remote and across the world. So um, you know, we, we do find that, you know, the customers that are using it love it, but many of the customers are simply still not aware of, uh, of, of this capability, which, um, which I think is free. Yeah. So, Top tip, if you're using a lot of Dell servers, ask, uh, ask about Repository Manager. It might save you a lot of time. And then just to, uh, just to finish up, I just wanted to kind of, kind of give you a quick sample of, um, of one of the platforms that we actually announced yesterday. And, and we're um, very pleased to kind of have it with us. So, so this is um, 
This here is, uh, is the, our newest blade platform. So this is a, a, a PowerEdge M420. So as you can see, and I hope you agree, that's a, a pretty you know, hyper-dense server platform. So it has uh, a couple of the latest E5 CPUs, supports uh, 10 gig fabrics, uh, has up to a hundred just over 190 gig of potential memory capacity and uh, in the f in the front here let me just pick one out it supports uh, little SSDs a couple of little SSD drives so um, it extremely neat and you know in particular we see this we'll see this being used for uh, high performance computing but also for cloud type infrastructures where customers are going to value you know clearly the 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 density and power efficiency and performance of uh, this kind of platform so so that picture there is is one of our blade chassis so that's where the shared power and cooling infrastructure is these are the these are the these blades in the front in the rear you've got the switching infrastructure so you know, uh, converge capable switching, 10 gig, but also support for, you know, fiber and indeed inf InfiniBand switching, and also uh, a shared management infrastructure, so uh, management hardware for, you know, remote monitoring of, uh, of all those blades is kind of, kind of standard in the ecosystem of the chassis. But uh, right there, if my maths is correct, you can have in what is a, a, a 10 u high chassis, which is what about sort of so big in a rack, uh, up to uh, 32 two socket servers, which is what 64 CPUs and is over 500 computing cores. So really being able to you know deliver a you know very very different level of density and manageability through you know s some of some of this uh, infrastructure innovation and we've importantly been able to achieve this with inside the existing power envelope of that blade chassis yeah so we're not asking you to upgrade power supplies or increase cooling we've doubled the density for the same power envelope yeah what about cooling same same thing with Fans are all standard. So, so that's a, just a, a quick advert for that platform announced yesterday. We have it here, so so do come and have a have a look at it on the on the stand. So just to uh, j so just to wrap up, yeah, uh, just want to sort of reiterate um, s some of the you know e engineering and customer uh, interaction we have around you know, driving kind of leading edge infrastructure, s server and compute infrastructure for this kind of virtualized and cloud world which covers everything from you know, what we're doing in, inside the single you know, 12th generation server through some of these new um, you know, modular architectures like Blades and also uh, our new uh, cloud-based C-class servers which we also have on, on the booth out there being able to drive you know, uh, new levels of density and power efficiency. Uh, things like the, um, the virtualization pods like VStart and also their kind of close cousins uh, around packaged VDI based, uh, based solutions. Right through to uh, things like uh, custom modular data centers that we're even doing for customers now. There's a, a banner behind our stand around uh, a system that we built for uh, eBay, where b basically you know th that is like a conventional shipping, well, you know, relatively conventional shipping container that is f full of infrastructure. So we're able to um, help uh, eBay, and in fact, we've got a video there of uh, Microsoft Bing Maps as well, uh, deliver f f from 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 scratch to completion a new data center project in three months using uh, these uh, modular data centers. And they arrive on the back of 18 wheelers pre-built in Dell factories. Now, you know, you won't see them on a price list. 
that th those are custom enga in engagements that we have with you know the kind of b some of the biggest cloud providers but I think it is indicative of you know where these kind of converged solutions are, are heading and um, you know we're, we're tracking all that really closely so let's uh, let's perhaps finish there I hope you've found uh, you know all of that uh, useful and enlightening we have you know a lot of people from Dell here today on the booth and we'd be only too pleased to talk to you and try and show you you know any of the things that and more that that we've shared with you today and you know we certainly hope that it's been a, a, a great use of your time so thank you very much for attending